Here we go. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Three Steps to Kayaking. This is a program where we really help with uh, building confidence and competence on the water. In this program, we really aim to share knowledge about tools and gear and equipment to get you on the water with fun and safety and to help you gain skills for building your confidence and competence as a sea kayaker, as well as help develop sea personship for more fun and safe and rewarding experiences on the water. My name is Hans Trupp. I'm a longtime track pilot and a sea kayaker and director of development with that company, as well as uh, a longtime outdoor educator. I want to welcome you to the program. And today's subject uh, we're very excited to unpack is the key to expedition leadership. And this is relevant to uh, anybody on and off the water. It's completely transferable. And it's a very, very simple model that can help with leadership development in many aspects of your life. But we're going to center this conversation around, uh, around expedition leadership. So uh, let's get plugged right into this. I want to start by introducing a very special guest. And that is, I want to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Edder. He has some very profound insights and uh, depth of skills in group management and communication, which support his work as both a guide, an educator, and a business leader. And Edder holds uh, on the sea kayak side a um, uh, BCU four-star certification for sea leader and a UKKCC coach certification and senior instructor level. Uh, and program supervisor with the National After Leadership School in their sea kayaking discipline. And he's been a level three track pilot for a long time and has been instrumental in helping us develop a couple of our flagship uh, products in terms of experiences, the camps and tours. He's helped us develop a leadership expedition course in uh, Baja California Sur, Mexico, in the Gulf of California, as well as the Pacific Rim Surf Camp on the west coast of BC, just off of Vancouver Island. And uh, uh, really rich in um, his contribution to, uh, to track and to our program development here. Uh, at track, we like to often say that everything's better with Edder. Edder, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. That's a nice uh, presentation. <laughs> Everything is better. Eh? <laughs> Everything is better with everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the this, uh, three steps of kayaking. And then I'm, I'm glad and happy to be here to be part of it. Really great. Thank you, Edder. So um, not only being a lifelong educator uh, in outdoor education and a committed sea kayaker, is what, you know, you're involved with some other gigs. I understand that you're currently uh, working with a leading a growing company in the transportation industry. How do you apply expedition leadership to your team there? Well, that's a great question. And it can be a very extensive answer, but, uh, but let me tell you this, thanks to the, all the background and experience that I've been developing, being out there in the nature where everything out there is you cannot control, uh, has served me to uh, apply in different stages and develop my team uh, to start changing uh, the business. It's a family business and uh, it's, um, it's grateful to see that the 471 uh, leadership model that we used to use a lot in the expeditioning with Knowles uh, applies every single day in the, <laughs> in the uh, transportation business. Uh, within the team, and then now it's uh, I'm starting to expand that outside with other companies, um, which it's helping the industry for sure in my in my uh, community. Excellent, really fantastic. I love how, you know your your skills that you've developed as a uh, as an outdoor educator and expedition leader are completely transferable into your front country life, and it sounds like they're making a positive impact not only in your business but in your community as well. Uh, so, um, Edder, one of the things that I love uh, uh, about working with you is your ability to really break things down into their simplest forms. Share that in a way that builds confidence and clarity and then build on top of that progressively as you go. And you do that in such an artful way with um, uh, compassion and uh, a consistent cadence that feels really uh, encouraging. It's uh, incredible mentorship 
capacity that you have uh, that um, I'm, I'm excited to tap into here. So you mentioned something about uh, working with the uh, the National Outdoor Leadership School. We'll unpack that in just a second. Normally, at her, I would ask people, you know, to kind of explain where they are um, from a sea kayaker's perspective. But at her, you're near Mexico City right now, completely landlocked. So I'm not going to ask you that. <laughs> but you've done a lot of your kayaking and a lot of your leadership and guiding and program development for sea kayaking in the Gulf of California. If I could ask you for just a moment, just to kind of anchor us and get a sense of place as, as though we're, you know, imagining how we're going to apply this leadership, paint a picture, picture for us of what paddling or sea kayaking in Baja is like. Take us there. <laughs> Great. Um, how could that, um, Kathy, Jeff? <laughs> Let's, uh, let's say that you start in an amazing place in the world um, where like everywhere you look at, it's just a magnificent piece of land that makes you feel alive, right? And then from there, like you got it with a bunch of people that are kind of like looking for, in a sense, they're looking for the same um, adventure, um, but true to, to be said in, in life, you have, you have your you have the same experience for everybody but everybody will like um digest it differently depending on which stage in life they are right so what i love about being in baja and the expedition in itself is that uh, it's a way that you can really get to know yourself if you uh let loose yourself and be part and get involved with nature and then the best part is that you can work with a team um that are there for uh, make uh, things happen and achieve the goal that you are looking for. And uh, sometimes you, well, at least my experience with expeditions and especially with the track uh, expeditions, it's that folks come down and they, they're they really like, you don't have to do a lot of work. You just, uh, you're just there to help maintain and give form and then probably shape a little bit when it's necessary uh, for the group to work together to achieve what uh, we set up as a, as a com uh, common goal for the expedition. And then the rest is just to have fun because you cannot, you cannot learn, you cannot achieve anything if you don't have fun, but you have to be careful. Too much fun can be dangerous. <laughs> okay, we'll leave that one hanging. But so um, Ed or, uh, a couple of folks who just joined in and they've, uh, they've, um, they've asked on the chat room, um, you know, who the speaker is. I just want to reintroduce you for Graham. We're speaking with uh, with Edder, who is a longtime sea kayaker and uh, business coach and business leader uh, from Mexico. And uh, he's been instrumental in working with Cat Track Kayaks to develop a couple of our flagship programs. Um, let's get back to the subject matter here, Edder. Um, you'd mentioned uh, uh, about a lot of your expedition leadership has come from your work uh, that the National After Leadership School and its programs provide as a laboratory. How would you define uh, leadership from that perspective? Um, great. I think I think I before starting to develop my beliefs about or my learning about leadership, like. Uh, I used to believe that there's leadership was just for us special people, right? But then as I was progressing and then I was learning more and more about the, um, the leadership that we were teaching at NOS and also what the leadership that I was looking at and then just being surrounded by great people. Um, I learned that everybody, no matter who you are, you are a natural leader. You just have to like work to better your strengths and then just uh, work to... Um, uh, learn about your, um, uh, sorry, I forgot the word, <laughs> uh, weakness, and then just uh, trying to improve them, right? And then I would say that leadership is uh, now I can see as a situationally appropriate actions that direct or guide us uh, or your group to achieve realistic goals. And uh, that's something that it's, uh, it's just changed my perspective about being out there and the expeditions. And now that I'm uh, sharing time with expeditions and the business, it's just like, it's amazing just to see how 
like using the tools that you have acquired or that you're learning, you apply them and then just like things can just change for the better. Really great. I love how you've taken that, that definition and made it super succinct as situationally appropriate actions uh, that direct or guide our groups to set and achieve realistic goals. Really fantastic. And it sounds like the, the other thing I'm taking from your explanation of um, around definitions of leadership is that you really see that it's uh, accessible to everyone. Uh, it's not just reserved for a few. So I'd love for people in the chat room right now, as you're paddling with friends, um, or if you're on expeditions or on day trips, uh, what are some of the leadership activities or roles that you play? Let's just set the stage here. Um, what, do, what do you recognize as opportunities for leadership uh, that in your paddling among your friends? Um, please pop into that and chat as we talk about this. But Edder, I want to start by asking you, you know, why is leadership so important on an expedition? Well, let's just put it this way. If you don't, if you don't have clear leadership with a, within a group, then you have a bunch of people just running in different directions and then just the fun can be just a disaster right so right. i would say that it's important for people in an expedition that understand that everyone plays a leadership role no matter what that role will be but it's important for them to know uh what they're doing there right uh it is critical to communication and culture safety you know? um let's uh it's uh i've been i learned different ex situations and experiences that if you don't have uh leadership then the culture that you are trying to create it's just gonna it's going on that downhill um line and then that is probably gonna have uh everybody have a really bad experience and uh uh, it's a safety matter, right? You want to yeah. be safe doing what you love doing, no matter that is the first time, like 10,000 times that you've been out. Uh, it's very important that you have leadership just to uh, create that safetyness uh, for everybody in there. And then I would say that it's uh, very essential for um, effective goal achievement, right? Uh, if you if you don't have, uh, you might have really good goals and dreams and but then you don't want to be part of the, the statistics where people are um, trying to achieve really great uh, goals, but then for the lack of uh, leadership, and it's not for the lack of willingness, right? But it's just for the lack of leadership. Like sometimes people do not achieve that. And then um, there is, uh, I, 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 cross, I come across with different people that I've learned that they have some sort of uh, frustration feelings or emotions. Uh, due to uh, lack of achievement of their goals on expeditions and they like sea kayaking, backpacking, climbing, or nowadays also on, uh, on um, uh, in the business world. So I would say those four things will be kind of like more critical for me to think about. Yeah, great. It really sounds what underscores all of it is that um, effective leadership is essential or at least linked to uh, effective goal achievement. Yeah, right. and it supports safety and fun and, uh, and, and cultural development. So let me ask you this question. Um, uh, can you share with us a story where expedition leadership just broke down? <laughs> How many you want? <laughs> <laughs> let's, start yeah. with, let's start with one, one, uh, one, one short and poignant and juicy one. All right. Uh, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the very first expedition that I that I had as a member of a team, right? Uh, I guess I was I was in Baja California as well. Uh, this was a backpacking expedition, and then there was a I I invited my my brother, my younger brother. Uh, he didn't have any expedition and experience, neither did I. I the most I had was just going climbing on a climbing wall right, in a gym. And then this friend from the climbing gym, he just like organized an expedition to climb the Picacho del Diablo, the highest peak in Baja California. Um, and uh, so there is no organization, right? There is just like, hey, we're gonna go and do this uh, expedition. Who wants to come? And I'm like, well, let's go. And then my brother came to visit for a vacation. And um, 
and then we say, well, let's go. And then he asked to buy, like to bring backpack on the, all the gear and like the food that we need. And I had no idea. So we did our best and we came, uh, we figured out, like we sort things out and then we came out with a backpack, right? So here we go. We set up on an expedition. And I remember the, the, only, the only meeting we had about the expedition and the goal setting it was, and defining the roles was just driving into the mountain base. Um, we pulled out the band, uh, he pointed out the peak, and then we were like, okay, we're going that over there. So then from there, we just went to the drop off, put the backpacks, and then all of a sudden, there was, there was only one guy that we were like probably 10 people. And then in less than an hour, uh, of starting hiking, you could have, you had two teams, the faster ones and slow ones. Mm -hmm. And then my brother and I, we had a really good like physical condition. We play soccer. And uh, so we were like, we can go with the front ones, but then the guy was on the back one. So we were like, no, let's go with the one that knows about this. And then all of a sudden, like we started hiking this was two days in to climb Picacho. So the first night, somehow we ended up again in the same spot. And so it was a relief. We cook, we have fun. And then the next day we just set up, we start hiking. And then that night, nobody made it to camp. At the end of that night, we have three teams, three groups. The guy had one group. My brother and I decided to join one guy that supposedly he had experience backpacking. And he had climbed that peak, and we were just following, right? And the, the first, the, the third group, it, they went in front, and then they were the first ones. They were the ones that knew everything. So basically, that night, everybody ended up in a different spot. The guy couldn't sleep because he went out to seek for the groups. And the next day in the morning, around like 10 a.m., we kind of we went back and found the leader and the group. So, uh, and then uh, around noon, the whole group got re reunited. And uh, at that point, that was the climbing day. And the guy was like, well, let's just see how far we can get. And then we just started hiking. Uh, but then eventually we just stopped. We didn't make it even like third of the way up. And then we came down and um, we got there. And I guess uh, everybody had fun. There were some frustrations going on because we didn't climb the peak and uh, some people were worried about the others and then there were some crying and all of that. And eventually we all came together. Everybody was like, nah, okay, we being there. We tried to make the best out of it, but then we came out uh, the next day, just hiking up. And then, so basically I can tell you that uh, since being my first experience, I ended up a little frustrated because I was like, well, is this what backpacking is about or expedition is about? I have read different stories and like how you can successfully climb and all of that. And then that, at that point, I realized, well, this is what it is. And then eventually after I started just hiking, sea kayaking, leading expeditions, I realized that, well, at that point it was... We're very lucky that everybody came out safely yeah. uh, mm -hmm. because it was just a mess. And uh, I can tell you that there was no really clear leadership involved in that expedition. Yeah, sounds like it was a, a, a powerful event for you that uh, helped to shape the way that you embraced uh, expeditioning and leadership in the future. Um, and a great story that illustrates the importance of, uh, of how leadership is connected to to goal achievement. Uh, let me ask you this question then, Ed, um, what example do you have of a leadership or an expedition where the leadership really came together very well? I can tell you about an expedition and actually in Baja. Uh, Baja is characterized by these big strong winds that come from the north. And then all of a sudden, if you are not ready and prepared, like everything can just messed up and then uh, Worst case scenario is like you can even lose people, right? There's been experiences out there that um, people uh, have uh, actually harmed themselves and even some deaths because of uh, the lack of 
great leadership on like reading weather and seamanship, sea personship, right? So the expedition that I'm talking about, like we started as a group and then we 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 set up the guidelines and then we just took uh, every every day, one day at a time, right? We started like working on like the structure of the, the expedition, like roles and um, examples. We had like newbies, like people that haven't um, really like paddled uh, in their lives. Um, and uh, so you start like little by little and eventually you are like, okay, so I don't know if everybody is gonna get at the same level, but we are gonna be like figure it out, like just to, just to stay in a really safe environment. And then in, a, in an environmental situation where we can control our group and with the skills that we have. So we started paddling, we were working, we spent little time in the water, like we uh, as, like traveling, we spent more time working on skill development. There were some folks that were bored because they had more skills than others. But eventually I can tell you that the, there was this day, probably was like 12th day in, and we were supposed to arrive to a beautiful place that is called San Basilio along the coastline. And then there's this strong wind that started hitting uh, from the morning. And then we had to go to that place just because we were gonna have a resupply. It was the end of the ration, so we had to like move along, right? So we set up, we start early in the morning. Uh, we started at first light. Uh, the group had some uh, experience already. The boats were lighter, they were, they were stronger. But then we, we didn't have really a situation where everybody had to be focused, right? Mm -hmm. uh, until that morning. <laughs> so we are paddling. Everybody is kind of a little like um, aware, like I, I would say with a little adrenaline because there's wind. We never really have experienced that wind in the morning. So we're paddling, but uh, there's a lot of like, like little quietness in the morning, you know, but eventually things to start building and the group is noticing, we are like working together and all of a sudden we have this strong wind. And then we're paddling and we didn't, uh, as, as leaders or responsible for the group, we decided that we're not gonna make it to the final point. So, but then we had a backup plan and then we figure out where we're gonna land. And eventually we had to use that, that place for landing. But the coolest thing that happened is that we, we, we perform uh, um, a switch uh, kayakers from boats, you know? Uh, we had a, 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 a boater that wasn't a single boat and it was a little like sick. And then we pass it on to a double and the double we pass it on to single. People were like working as a team very efficiently. As, as we were like working with this switch, the, the rest of the group was holding position. We were very aware of what was happening. And then the sea was building, right? So we did this because we knew that the landing was gonna be surf land. And then that's kind of one of the most scary things that I can think of, right? Uh, because there is, there is little you can do uh, and you cannot control the water and the power of it that, that it has, right? So eventually the group had like worked really well together. People started like they show, they put into practice the skills that we have practiced like days before when they, some of them were getting really bored because it was sunny in Baja, there's no wind, what are you talking about, right? And then eventually like we landed every single person, uh, nobody capsized, right? Everybody was in a high energy. You, you could see the group like working together. Like as soon as the first boat landed, that person was helping the second and eventually we were and so on. So then we get, got everybody out uh, and then we look back into the ocean and as a group, and it was just like so much ex excitement. And the seas have like grown from like, we started like one foot, like we had like, like three foot, two meters, almost like six foot high on the last boat. And that was, that was a lot. And then I, at that point, the group understood that all the work that were happening every single day just like was the key to that successful move that there that that's, day and then that's that's kind of what i can tell you right now as a, my experience and a very successful one 
that sounds like a really great story where um, uh, incrementally the work that you did really, you really put a foundation under this so that everybody in that dynamic environment could fill important leadership roles in order to get that group uh, in conditions that were out of their comfort zone and beyond their uh, known skill set at that point safely onto the beach. Really fantastic story that really, I think, anchors this conversation. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, is that you mentioned this, uh, this model uh, that really helps in teaching leadership. And uh, it sounds like a tool that you've used in developing leaderships, uh, teams, both in expeditions and um, off the water as well. I think you refer to it as the, the 471 uh, leadership model. Um, tell us just a little bit about what you mean by that. What is that in a big picture? What is 471? as a model. Yeah, I would say that it's a, it's a succinct way to explain the ambiguous uh, term of leadership, right? Uh, this separates into three distinct different categories, four roles, seven skills, one, one style. And okay. then, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, it sounds like that would be a great place to start. Let's just, uh, let's just share and unpack, I guess, that as a model, um, as one way to view leadership as it relates to making leadership situationally appropriate for expeditions. Um, yeah. so, so then how would you describe, and you said it's four roles, seven skills, and one style. What are the four roles? And maybe while you do that, I could bring up a graphic um, uh, that can be helpful for people to start thinking about right now as we engage in this. What are some of the roles that you see as leadership opportunities on an expedition? Well, let's say that the four roles are, are the ways that leaders can apply leadership to help the team to set and attain goals, right? And yes. then I would say that uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, the designated leadership role. And, uh, and then I can tell you that a designated leader, leader role is uh, it's the head of the architect and a guardian of the group process, right? She or he can delegate uh, and should col collaborate when possible uh, with the group. And uh, complex, uh, potentially risky or tough, tough acti activities and decisions are best handled with the designated leader um, when they are like guiding and monitoring the process. And then in, in some ways I can say that it's kind of like the person that helps the group like contain uh, the leadership and the opportunities and make sure that we're we're moving into the direction of our goals. Um, okay, so examples of, uh, of, um, of designated leadership are would be like the, uh, the point person on the pod or the flank person on the pod or the person to uh, manage the beach to make sure that all the kayaks are above the water lines and there's no gear down there or the leader of the day or the navigator are all designated leadership roles. Is that, is that right? Yeah, totally. Okay, great. I think that's how most of us consider like expedition leadership is the designated leader. It's the most obvious thing, right? Um, but it doesn't stop there. Tell us uh, what other kind of leadership roles do you lean on? Well, you have the peer leadership, right? And then we have peer leadership larger, largely in our teams. Um, every person, let's say that one definition, definition that I like is that each person sees needs to be what needs to be done and does it without uh, hierarchy or like without having to be told what to do, right? Um, yeah. And this type of leadership works better when members clarify their responsibilities for, uh, I would say that who is responsible for what, um, and then that's how you can just like help uh, help it to work better in the team. Really fantastic. So it sounds like it's also almost serves as also a uh, an added layer of accountability uh, that is uh, somewhat more powerful than either you know self accountability or even uh, accountability from a designated leader. Yes, totally. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, uh, tell us then, what is, what, how do you see this, the, this uh, act of followership? How is that a, a leadership role? I would say that uh, in a normal day, like if the designated leader per se of the leader of the day 
the next morning in a kayaking expedition. Mm -hmm. It's like it's the night before we give a brief of what's going to happen. And then let's say we're going to do weather weather check in the morning, right? And then one peer leadership, uh, good leader, peer leadership uh, example is that show up on time, all right? Participate and then help and support the, the designated leader, uh, but participating like uh, giving your input, the observations that you are seeing out there, right? Uh, I would say also like questioning when you think that needs to be uh, need to be questioned, right? Um, and then supporting the team by following and doing what needs to be done or what you've been asked for, uh, in order to help achieve um, the team goals. And that's like supporting the leadership of others, the designated, but at the same time just helping each other, right? Um, uh, complete task just just for the for the better of the group and then also for the uh, if you have that peer leadership you can help the group move forward and then eventually avoid surf landings later on the day got it okay terrific yeah so it's really a um, a, a focus on the greater goal uh, for the group and in support of those designated roles how does that differ from self-leadership well, I would say that self-leadership, it's um, everybody in the group is a leader by virtue, right? And who they are and how they influence others, you know, by the position they hold. Uh, I would say this leadership, uh, this is leadership through character and judgment. And I would say mm. this is like, <clears throat> if I'm in an expedition, I'm going to make sure that I am, uh, I am part of the group that helps move forward by doing what I need to do to, to self-care, uh, right? Uh, I, 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 I cook when I need to cook. I feed myself. I drink water. Uh, I am on time. I take care of my gear. And then I respect myself. And then that way I can respect others. Uh, it's just kind of like uh, whatever, whatever I do, uh, no matter if I have a designated role or not, um, it's gonna it's gonna help and influence others just to do the same. Really great. So it's really uh, largely around uh, self responsibility and uh, engagement and showing up specifically uh, in that expedition as a contributing member. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah really great. So really, what that suggests, Edder, um, Thanks for unpacking that. Uh, that element, that component for us. So it suggests that everyone in every situation has leadership opportunities to play and a leadership role to play. Yes. Cool. So let's discuss the, ne the next component. And um, I just for folks's um, information, I just took the kind of descriptions that you laid out there, Edder, and put them into the chat uh, as we you know, think about how folks can build this model for uh, themselves. But you said we've identified, so the first bit of sort of situational leadership is recognizing what role are we actually serving now? Are we stepping into a role of designated leadership or is our role in support of a designated leader as an active follower? Or is my role in this situation peer leadership and to support my fellow teammates? I get that. Fantastic. So now let's talk about the seven skills uh, that um, uh, you mentioned, the seven part. Uh, tell us about that big picture. What are they collectively? Well, let's say uh, there are seven, seven skills that if you really look, look at them and then just put yourself on a, on a baseline, uh, you can see how you have developed each, each one of them and then just work towards improving them, right? One of them is the competence. Uh, well, the sevens are like comp competence, communication, judgment and decision-making, um, self-awareness, vision and action, um, tolerance for adversity and uncertainty and expedition behavior. Okay, so these are certain, these are the skill sets that we know um, that have been really recognized over a great deal of uh, study in the laboratory of expedition after expedition after expedition as expedition leadership was studied that are central to uh, goal achievement and uh, other measures of success within an organization. 
And so it sounds like if we can take uh, for expedition leadership development, if we can take a look for ourselves, assess each one of these and take active steps towards improving that particular skill set, our overall expedition leadership will improve. Yes, totally. Okay, so let's talk about these and what they mean on expedition. The first thing you mentioned was competence. Uh, what is that? How do you see that? Well, competence is something that I like to think about, like, uh, because I work with people that come to an expedition, they don't know anything about kayaking per se. And then they're very, really nervous because there's other folks that they are really good at it or they have experienced before. And I would say competence is something that you build day by day by practicing, by having a growth mindset, right? And then just like getting out of your comfort zone and then just from there, you ask questions, you use your, your self-leadership just to improve uh, uh, your knowledge about or your competence on, on a specific skills, skill. And then just like little by little, you are, you are working and eventually that competence that you started with uh, being probably, I don't know, kayaking very small, you end up with, uh, with more, uh, being more competence out there. And then that also is gonna, it's gonna be reflected as a becoming, uh, helping the group being more like, stronger uh, as, as a unit. That's so great. You know, what comes to mind as you're saying that is the example of both of us working for the National Idol Leadership School. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm recognizing now that our objective was to teach leadership, but we always started with the hard skills of like, here's your backpack, here's how you pack it, here's a rope, here's how you belay, um, here's, how to, here's how to do a crevasse rescue, um, those kinds of things. So we were starting with competence, uh, but we were doing it in pursuit of leadership, kind of like your story you told about uh, you know, working every day of the expedition toward that moment that you were gonna be uh, winded off the water and had to act quickly and definitively for the safety of the group. Really yes. great. Okay, awesome. Um, the next thing that you identified, I think was communication. How does that play into this uh, uh, as a skill set? Well, I would say that is very crucial communication. And that's something that uh, at least from where I am and then the way that I, I was educated, uh, we didn't really spend time on this topic, right? And this skill. And then communication goes from like uh, building my empathy for myself first and then just for others, because it's really easy to misunderstand what other people are trying to say or are saying, and then just interpret it using your judgment, your, your life experience, and then eventually it becomes in a catastrophe, right? And uh, the, the catastrophe of the interpersonal gap. <laughs> yes, totally. And then yeah. eventually, uh, as you develop this skill, you are learning that there is there are different ways that you can like uh, become more aware of like what communication uh, it's about because it's not just one topic. It's just like it's immense, right? And then you learn how to better communicate. You you learn how to uh, solve conflict because there conflict something is going to happen. Uh, we are different people, right? And then we just need to be aware that that's happening. That is part of the nature, right? Um, you are also going to learn like how your words affect others. Uh, and then, uh, so you need to be very, very conscious about what you're saying or how you're doing, right? And then from there, you can go for like um, how to make decisions, right? How much, uh, which is part of the communication. Uh, well, yeah, yeah in, in a sense. <laughs> Yeah. So it sort of goes right into, uh, you know, that communication informs uh, judgment and decision making. Right. Yeah. OK. And, and that's a skill in and of itself, uh, the judgment and decision making. How do you suggest somebody develop the judgment and decision making skill? Well, basically, in a kayaking environment, it's just like you got to get out and, and try. Right. You got to practice. And then the judgment is going to happen, uh, in my experience, by uh you you ask you you try to get the best the best idea of what you're going to do and then just go for it and do it and then the experience that you have is going to develop the judgment that you're going to have for the next time you have to experience it yeah and I that's the beautiful that's the beautiful of an expedition because every day every every hour every move that you have you're going to be developing that judgment and really really fantastic yeah, yeah. So that skill set is developed just by getting out there. And I love what you're kind of bringing together here is that really good judgment comes from just 
poor experiences. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's that epic that, you know, like that experience you described is where leadership really came together, um, where everyone was challenged, right? Uh, it was that experience that helped them have better judgment. Now they have more respect for those wind patterns. Now they have more respect for taking care of themselves so they don't get seasick. And uh, those types of elements are really fantastic um, and important that everyone's doing that on an expedition. Um, it sounds like what underscores both of these things, communication and um, judgment, decision-making is self-awareness. How does that play in as a leadership skill and how would you help develop that? Well, it's one of the skills that I like the most because it's the one that you have to be like, it's, it's about who you are uh in in i would say in the put it in the context of the activity as a sea kayaker or as a member as a member of the group you gotta you gotta know where you are at right you gotta you gotta know your strengths and also your weakness right and then just be humble enough to uh accept that because that's that's the first step to actually start growing and then becoming better and then just um I'm going to combine right here, right? Yeah. So if you want to increase your competence, you have to be aware of where you are. So you start there. And then from there, you start asking the questions, right? And then um, I think that it's very important. For me, it's a strong skill because sometimes people are afraid of, of asking because they see others that are, um, have more experience uh, in determining uh, in a specific activity or skill. And then sometimes you just like shut up, you just like hide, right? And then that's preventing you from actually uh, learning and growing, right? And uh, yeah. so that self-awareness, I, I think that's the, the, the beginning of it. But at the same time, it's your self-awareness of the impact that you have with others, because you can actually impact others by like positively or negatively. And then mm -hmm. you have to make a choice, like how you want to, what role you want to play on that regard right right so self-awareness extends into uh also uh the self-awareness um, of how you're uh it includes the awareness and appreciation of other people's uh experience through your actions or impact right yeah and really also great. To, to nature because and we nature. are we are in nature and nature is the most important also hmm. Let's, uh, the, these two other ones are a little interesting. They're not typical leadership skills. Um, help us understand uh, these two. Uh, there's tolerance for adversity and uncertainty. Uh, how do you help develop that? And how is that important for leadership? Well, it depends. It depends what you're doing in, in an expedition, but you basically cannot control anything outside of yourself. I, I like to believe the only thing that I can control is like how I choose to respond to uh, the stimulus that is happening outside, right? Mm. So then that right there is where, like, for me, it's the important piece of the tolerance for that adversity and the uncertainty that I don't even know if I'm going to make it. And my example of like uh, when we had to land, surf land uh, that day is like our goal was to get to the Russian spot, right? And then not getting there, like, can frustrate people and then just kind of, like, uh, make you feel like uh, you didn't accomplish it. But you have to make ju just your judgment and then make a, make a decision and then you got to get to get out. And sometimes um, tolerance for adversity could be, like, I need to be tolerance for this cold, you know, the, the rainy day that is happening, and also that I didn't make it to the X, right? And yeah. then I need to be tolerant because... Uh, sometimes we um, judge ourselves and then really hard and then make ourselves feel like um, sometimes uh, bad, either ourselves or to others, just because we didn't accomplish something. So I guess if you develop this, uh, this skill and then just by um, being humble, uh, understanding what's happening or what happened and then you cannot control the outside, I think that's kind of one, one good step to start with. And then from there... Uh, every day it's gonna be you're gonna have to experience something like that uh, i was yeah. talking about weather but also like my teammate just like made like burned the, the beans and it's like well it just happened right <laughs> yep uh, boy i tell you what that's a transfer 
transferable leadership skill right now is that tolerance for adversity and uncertainty. Um, so critical. Uh, it sounds like it's also such a critical skill set for just staying positive through uh, whatever the expedition or the environment gives you. Let's talk about expedition behavior. Now that one's kind of internal, I know, to uh, uh, to Knowles, it's, uh, to the National After Leadership School. It's kind of a cult cultural term that's been coined a leadership skill. Uh, for folks that don't have that experience, how would you describe expedition behavior? Uh, I'll say that th the nicest example that I experienced is that sometimes in the morning after a long day of uh, paddling, and then you're really tired, like somebody just comes by in the morning and then brings you a cup of coffee, right? Uh, it's just, it just, for me, it's just expedition behavior. It's what you do out there that uh, helps the group in, uh, in any aspect, right? Morally, emotionally, um, intellectually, that helps and supports others uh, to, ex to have a better experience overall, right? It can come from like the cup of coffee. It can come like, hey, I, I'm going to help you pack your boat because, I don't know, you are cold or something, or I'm going to help you understand um, how to read better the map because that's your goal. Like, it's just being there as a source of, uh, for others, right, without doing their job, right? Yeah. It's just that little extra. It's like a, that cherry on the, on the, on the cake. Um, Right. So it's a skill set that's really often uh, uh, exemplified or, um, I guess, exercised in the roles of, um, of peer leadership and um, self-leadership. Uh, anyway, it, it sounds like it exists everywhere, but everything from like choosing to leave your hat on uh, on long mountaineering expeditions <laughs> because your hair is a mess and stinks and is you know, slumping <laughs> dandruff to uh, serving hot drinks to people in bed. Yeah, right. really fantastic. But it's a, uh, it's a, uh, um, Sandy's got a, a, a word here in the chat. He says he, he, says he uses that as uh, contribution. Um, but yeah, great skill set. Okay, so we've unpacked those uh, sort of seven skills that I know you and I have learned to embrace as essential skills for expedition leadership. Um, one thing you just talked about, I love this, is that you also illustrated that you draw upon different ones at different times. And in some ways, they're really interconnected. Um, and it can be interesting to isolate uh, them, but they can be developed independently, but then used in concert. Yes, totally. And then I think that's the key of it. You know, like uh, you cannot separate every single one. Like uh, by, uh, if you separate one at a time, like uh, you just want to go and focus on one thing, it's impossible because everything is interconnected. Like you cannot have a good expedition behavior if you don't have good judgment, right? Mm. Uh, or like uh, you're going to make a decision and then you, you don't communicate that and then you get frustrated because they didn't follow, right? So it's just like, um, just the, uh, as a leader, the more you like try to study and understand them like separately, but then at, at some point, like once you are in the day, but in, in, in the day and the, the daily activities, you just realize that they all are interconnected. Like uh, they, they cannot live without each other. And, and um, Right, so to become a better leader, one can focus on the development of the seven skills um, and building awareness around the four roles that exist for leadership opportunities. Um, how do you use these two components uh, and the acknowledgement of them to develop leadership on your teams? Um, let's say, the ones that I can think of right now, it's like uh, look for praise in public. Uh, sometimes that when I when using the four the roles uh, as a strong leadership, right? Just like help others to uh, understand uh, and then just praise them uh, when they are happening, right? Uh, just help like use the vocabulary in the daily activities. Um, so uh, I like to sorry. Yeah, so it sounds like for that one, you're really you're you're looking for those things when people uh, provide examples of that, 
And then when you say praise in public, you mean just like making sure that you voice that um, and acknowledge that uh, within a group so everyone can learn from that. It's like, oh, uh, he just called that self-leadership. That's what that is. I get that now. Or, oh, uh, he just said I'm really being supportive with good peer leadership. That's really great. So it takes these things and really elevates their status, it sounds like, and, and awareness. Great. Yeah. And then one thing that I like to do also, it's just that I, as I start my, my expedition with a group, I, from, from day one, uh, there is a transition uh, on the leadership role for, uh, for the group. And then I like to start from like, uh, I'm the one that is doing, you know, and they are the ones that are learning and observing, right? Yeah. And then as the day progress and I'm using vocabulary and I'm using example, like sometimes I, I, use a, I use a skill for the day to focus on, right? Ooh, or one, one, of, one role model for leadership, for uh, the four roles. And then I focus the day on that, uh, on that, that skill. And then through, through, uh, through the day, we're going to have different experiences. And then at the end of the day, I love having this um, debrief, right? This uh, uh, closure, because it's, it's the moment that we can learn more, more by uh, some others' experiences, right? And then yes. just, uh, sometimes because we started with a topic one day, at the end of the day, we just like make sure that we cover that topic from different perspectives and everybody gets involved. So that's, uh, that's another way that I, I like developing that leadership in our teams. And then uh, I've seen that it's, it, it works. Really fantastic. So let's talk, we've unpacked this idea of the four roles in leadership, the seven skills. You mentioned there's a, let's talk about the one signature style. Um, how do you see that as a leadership component? Well, to me, it's kind of like a, your, your signature, right? Uh, it's what uh, differentiate you or like, uh, and how you do that, I think uh, uh, you, you, have, uh, you have to be aware of what strengths you have as, as, as the leader, right? As, as a leader uh, that you can count on, on them and then to help you move through the day. But that doesn't mean that you have to be uh, really good at everything, right? You just, you just uh, as your signature, you try to understand and you use that strength just to move forward uh, along the day. But at the same time, you you want to make sure that you know, or you understand your um, uh, your weaknesses, right? And yes. then in that signature, you, you have to find your authenticity, you know? Yeah, you have to be vulnerable mm -hmm. as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to accept uh, sometimes things uh, as leader, like you, you wish you could do the same thing that others do, but guess what? It's not, it's not what your strength is, but that doesn't mean that you're less or more, right? It just means that you are different and then you have to embrace that difference. Because at the same time, because what you're feeling, probably somebody else is also feeling it, right? And then, but if you, if you, if you work on like understanding what your signature style is, um, you are gonna you are gonna move forward uh, more efficiently uh, through competence, and then just like you're gonna help more uh, your team to achieve the goals, right? Um, I, I would say that that's kind of one way that I can. Uh, so so great. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to speak then. Um, uh, then how do we bring these components together as a leadership model? Uh, how do we bring in the four roles of leadership, the seven leadership skills, and the one signature style that you just unpacked for us? Well, I would say because, because leadership is situational, you have to choose and, choose and apply, apply uh, the appropriate skills depending on what's happening, right? Uh, I would say step into an ap appropriate role. Um, uh, find your voice uh, so you can be an, an advocate for the team, right? Uh, let's say be intentional about how you respond to situations, right? Um, and then just make sure that um, that you are like, you are part of the team and you are observing what's happening and then just make sure that you speak up when needs to be, 
uh, when something needs to be said. Uh, and then that happens when you are, uh, you are observing your part of, what the, of the team and then you're looking for the better um, for, uh, for the team to achieve their goals. Really great, awesome. So it sounds like uh, in many ways, uh, what you're pointing at is that uh, the, the seven leadership skills are sort of a toolbox. The four leadership roles are a toolbox and we've got parts of our signature style that are more appropriate than others at certain times. And we pull the collection of, uh, of skills we need uh, and we pull the right role and we pull from our um, authentic self uh, and where those things overlap, like in this Venn diagram, that's what we call situationally appropriate leadership. Did I get that right? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Well, that's rich. Um, and one of the things that you other leaned on, it sounds like another way to really pull this together. You spoke about this, about a progression of leadership throughout an expedition as competency increases, as skills increase, as exposure to role modeling increases. Then um, I want to bring up a, a, a diagram here that often represents that path, if you will, from, you know, a really highly directive style that progresses in an arc toward more delegative uh, as another way to look at those four leadership roles from a guiding perspective. Perspective, uh, exactly. Um, so uh, really fantastic. Um, I think at this point, uh, it's really be really great to just open this up for um, uh, some questions. I'm going to bring that uh, that graphic down, editor. But that's super. That's super great. And I love one of the words that you had mentioned in terms of like um, uh, um, the stimulus and response. And um, it reminds me of this um, uh, Victor Frankel. Uh, the neurologist, the, psycho the um, psychologist uh, who uh, was quoted as uh, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. That really resonates with me as we, uh, as we talk about this and, and your reference in your story about you know, big crashing six foot waves as a, as a stimulus, <laughs> um, but really fantastic. Um, I welcome any, um, any, any questions in the chat or open this up. Um, uh, while we do that, Edder, what would you like to say about the transference of this model that you know, is developed in the context of expeditionary leadership? Um, how do you, what would you say about the transference of this into, into your front country leadership or running your logistics and transportation company? Well, I would say that um, the, everything that we have experienced on the, 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 the 471 uh, model, leadership model that we just uh, talked about. And um, when I came to the transfer now, um, like the, fir the first day when I, I was, I didn't have more uh, knowledge about the business that I was in. This is a family business. Like um, I just came to help and support my brother and my dad. And uh, at the beginning, I was totally like novice, right? And uh, it was really good to actually like sit back and then utilize that space that Victor was talking about, right? And then just I just I just had to 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 engage, right? Because I had an idea before coming into here, and it's like okay, so uh, I got I guess I just gotta I, I I have to help, but help was a big word, right? And then eventually I was like, okay, I'm not gonna feel overwhelmed, and I just sat back and I started like, okay. I need to start identifying what uh, what's happening here. Like this four seven one, one like what what roles are play are being played right now? What roles are not being used, right? And uh, and then from there I need to like utilize my self awareness and uh, and start looking at uh, what my role is gonna be and then what expertise do I bring to this team? And then eventually I I realized that. What I needed is it was just to like to take the leadership role and then the coach and trainer, right? And uh, and as I 
I had to do my work and I had to study the industry and I had to do all of these things that you have to do to improve in any skill uh, or any area in your life that you want to do. And you go oh, for it, right? Mm -hmm. But then eventually um, I started working and then I started transferring. Probably I wasn't using the vocabulary because that there was no context for everybody. But then I had to like um, uh, innovate and then I had to... Uh, transfer like the designated role like a leader uh designated leadership role i uh, and then i had to work with my brother and say okay so today you're gonna do this and then tomorrow uh, it's my turn and and i had to go and then the seven skills like when it came to drive the truck right because we need to move it to one place or another my competence level was like very low right but I, I went and I started working and I asked the, the right person. And then eventually I started building that competence. Like today I can drive it. It's not that my main, my main activity, right? But it's part, of, uh, it's part of that because sometimes the team needs somebody to drive it, right? Mm -hmm. And then so on, like that happens on finances on, uh, um, and uh, logistics and all of that. So I would say that um, for me, it was very useful so I didn't get overwhelmed. I didn't get frustrated. Well, there, there were moments that you get frustrated because nothing, you cannot control anything, right? And, uh, but you try to make the right moves and then eventually like magic things start happening. And when, when that start happening and you see your team that it's like working together and then they start talking to each other, they're making decisions. There is a, 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 a feedback uh, happening and then so all these skills that you start building with the group and then you start seeing that your company is shifting so I would say that it was very useful and important even if I didn't have experience before on the trucking business uh, and now today like after a few uh, years like now I can tell you that my uh, my sense of um, uh, accomplishment and satisfaction is high but I also, it's for the, the entire team. And it's just like another day in, in Baja, you know? Yeah. Okay, you gotta get out and then you just expect that things are gonna work out really well, but guess what? The sun start hitting, like, or the wind start hitting, right? Or like somebody just capsized and, or like somebody forgot this, the stuff or I don't know, something happens and then eventually your day can just be chaotic or you can actually do something to get the best out of it and make the best out of it in order so to achieve the goal. Yeah, so great. That's so fantastic. Such a rich story. Uh, thank you for that. So I invite everyone here. I mean, we've unpacked this model of uh, four, seven, one leadership. We identified seven skills that are unique and specific to expedition format. Um, uh, I invite those of you that uh, want to transfer these skills to take a look at your organization. If you're if you run a law firm and you have a team there, or if you're an engineer and you've got a group of designers, um, what are the skills that are essential for that group uh, for leadership? And uh, develop that. They may may there may be a lot of crossover. There may be a couple of things you change out. But I would invite you to kind of take a look at that and see how you can apply that to other aspects. Um, in final closing here, Edder, um, what comments would you offer about leadership development for sea kayakers? What encouragement do you provide, you know, this team, this audience who's come here to, with an interest in expedition leadership? Well, I would say that I've been doing some research and then there is a lot of different models out there. And I don't think that there is like one that is better than other. Like I would say that, uh, just go and then just like pick one and start using, right? And then just uh, get familiar with it if you can, and then go out on expeditions. Uh, in if I don't think people will feel like uncomfortable like beating others or like, but if you do, just like like get out, go out, be transparent, um, and then just like start applying them, right? If you uh, if you find interest in this four seven one, just like. Um, start applying it and then if you go out on the expeditions just like make sure that you set up that as a an expectation or a goal of yourself that you want to practice out there and then just get a little like context for people and uh, just one day at a time then you are going to be discovering new things because every day is going to be different right and the more you do the more uh, experience and um, the 
probably will feel easier to solve different uh, situations that you will, that you will experience out there. And uh, paddling, uh, it's going to be. I think it's it's one of the funnest things on earth. <laughs> and yeah. then just like practicing leadership out there just can bring lots of like great experiences uh, for you and your and your friends. That are fantastic. And uh, one thing, I guess, one of your next engagements then um, with. Uh, with track is you're taking a break from uh, being the executive of your, of your company and you're coming in uh, leading a kayak expedition in Baja in the Gulf of California out of Loreto um, that is basically centered around expedition leadership. And in that trip, um, we come together as a group, we assemble an expedition, and then we all participate in going in and, and, uh, and executing it. And what participants can come away with is how to really assemble and design and to uh, execute uh, an, ex an expedition of their own um, with this leadership information and with those kinds of uh, competencies that are essential for uh, getting boats into the water, getting the provisions together, setting up your contingencies, choosing your route, uh, navigating and uh, all the basics in there. Um, so uh, I, know, I know there are a few seats left on that. I'm gonna put a link to this um, and to our new uh, passport that Track has, which is the gateway for uh, joining any of our expeditions. It's a really handsome guide that we've developed that uh, is, um, provides a, a measure of insurance for making a commitment to a, uh, a trip in these uncertain times. But um, the one other link that I wanna put in here, um, Edder, is this really great article uh, that references this idea of tolerance for, uh, for adversity that you spoke to. And years ago, you and I worked with a guy named Warren McDonald. And, uh, and he came and he came on this very expedition in Baja and he had, um, he is a, a double amputee. He had no legs. Um, and uh, we worked with uh, um, his tolerance for uh, adversity. He was a rock star in that. And he published some of that information um, specifically in an e-zine. I know Red Bull did a, an article on him. Um, I'm going to put a link to that, the Warren McDonald article on the trip that we led together in Baja. And so it, it really is an example of somebody with incredible leadership that came on this trip as a double amputee for a seven day sea kayak expedition and illustrated tolerance for adversity every single minute he was out there. So um, Edder, I want to thank you for your time and for your experience and for your generosity here in sharing this with the group. Thank you for the invitation as well. I appreciate you uh, uh, coming to be part of this. I love it.